Life can hold many fears for us, but arguably the biggest fear, which has always faced humanity, is getting enough clean, fresh water for drinking and farming. With 60% of the world's surface covered in water, it's sometimes difficult to see how there could possibly be a water shortage. Of course, in truth, there is plenty of water, but there isn't enough clean, safe water in all the right places where humans need it. 97% of all Earth's water is seawater, which is too salty to use. 70% of all fresh water is locked up in ice at the poles, and most of the remainder is in the soil or underground, which leaves less than 1% of fresh water as accessible groundwater. This mainly comes in the form of rivers and lakes produced by rain, mist and snow. Most human settlements have gathered on riverbanks or where rivers meet the sea. These areas also produce the best farming land. As these concentrations of people have grown, especially over the last hundred years, in many areas human demand has outstripped nature's supply. As a result, pumped water from underground aquifers, created by groundwater seeping down through rocks, is now being used by a third of the world's population. But this can only ever be temporary because the amount of water being pumped out is much greater than nature's ability to replace it. We're going to look at this problem in two parts. First, what are the main features of the crisis? And in the second part, what can we do about it? So, just what are the main crisis points? There are probably more, but we are going to look at nine of them. Firstly, human world population is growing too fast, particularly in large urban areas, outstripping local sources of water. Attempts to bring in further supplies from elsewhere can damage agriculture and wildlife in those areas, and wastewater released into rivers and lakes is causing widespread pollution. Secondly, to meet this need we can create reservoirs and dams on river runs, but these can be expensive in economic terms as well as damaging to the environment and existing settlements. Thirdly, climate change means that the water supply has tipped from being a problem in some inland areas to being potentially disastrous. Peoples who just managed to survive for generations are now suffering life-threatening droughts and famines. For as farming becomes more intensive, fresh water in rivers and lakes is also being polluted by fertilizers which can result in toxic blue algae. This can result in ample water supplies becoming useless. 5. All water has mineral salts in it. As farming soil dries out, these salts are left behind in the soil, interfering with crop growth. The use of pumped underground water can make this worse, as it tends to have even more salts in it. As the soil dries further, erosion then can take hold, and the fertile topsoil is blown into the atmosphere. 6. Underground water supplies of fossil water are being depleted rapidly, and being affected by chemicals and bacteria seeping through from above ground. Since it is almost impossible to get these contaminants out, some water supplies are being rendered useless. 7. Water depletion is so great in some areas, whole rivers are disappearing. Depletion from the Yellow River in North China, the sixth longest river in the world, has been so bad there are months at a time when it fails to reach the sea altogether. 8. As water supplies fail or become polluted, crop yields fall. Some countries who have been self-sufficient in arable farming are now having to import food. In 2011, China had to import nearly 2 million tonnes of wheat. But, as the number of countries importing food rises, so the number of available exporters falls. Finally, much of what we call fresh water is anything but fresh. Currently, around 800 million people don't have access to safe water at all. It is reckoned half the world's hospital beds are occupied by patients suffering from waterborne diseases, and that 80% of all illnesses in India and one-third of deaths 
can be attributed to the same causes. The World Health Organization calculates that over one and a half million deaths annually are caused by diseases from unsafe water and poor sanitation. 3,000 children die every day. Killer waterborne diseases include botulism, cholera, dysentery, typhoid and polio. The list of problems is huge and growing larger every day, if only because there are more people on the planet who need more clean water. So after the break, we're going to look at some of the solutions that have been proposed. We've already looked at the considerable problems facing the world's water supply. Now let's turn our attention to what we can do about them. Since the problems are different depending on which part of the world we are looking at, let's split things up between the developed, the undeveloped and finally the developing world. Actually the problem for the developed world isn't one of water shortage at all. Technology and wealth can provide huge amounts of clean water for everyone but at increasing cost. In this case, if there is a problem, it is one for economics and politics. We can divide our look into two parts, cutting down consumption and then producing more clean water. There are three obvious ways of cutting consumption without actually needing to ration water. Introducing water meters has been shown to cut residential consumption by as much as 10 to 15 percent as householders seek to cut down their water bills. In addition, we can increase the unit cost of water to reduce wasteful use further. This can be done by government regulation or even taxation, with surpluses then invested to improve water supply in other ways. Finally, by repairing and replacing old water conduits, we can stop leakage, which can amount to 20 to 40 percent of the total water supply. As far as producing more clean water is concerned, there are numerous ways we can do this. Firstly, the most obvious is by improving distribution systems between areas with water and those without, using pipes, aqueducts and canals. The salination of seawater is another solution and is becoming a reality for cities near the coast. But the cost is still high, 50 to 80 US cents per cubic meter. This is the equivalent of pumping existing groundwater 1600 kilometers or up to 2000 meters above sea level. Some desalination plants are powered by renewable energy to cut the cost of production. Then there is recycling wastewater. This has been resisted for years. The idea of drinking someone else's wastewater has never been popular. But in Singapore, to avoid importing water from Malaysia, they have set up such a system which produces perfectly clean water, but at present mainly for industrial use. So for the developed world, even if the cost of producing clean water has to rise dramatically, it should always be available. In undeveloped countries, however, things are very different. Here, unhealthy water and poor sanitation are the problems. A 2006 United Nations report said clean water shortage often resulted from mismanagement, corruption, lack of appropriate institutions, bureaucratic inertia, and a shortage of investment. Under the World Health Organization UNICEF Millennium Development Goal, 
Since 1990, more than 2 billion people have gained access to improved drinking water, although an estimated 780 million still lacked it in 2010. Targets for improved sanitation, however, have been missed, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Over 2 billion people still have poor sanitation, and over 1 billion have no sanitation provisions at all. Often it's a vicious circle. Economic development cannot occur until there is clean, fresh water, but without economic development there will be no money to pay for the improvements. But while 3,000 children die each day from waterborne diseases, more help must be given to the poorest countries, unable to help themselves. Because of extreme poverty, normal capital investment is unlikely, so these countries have to rely on the World Health Organization, UNICEF and individual government aid. It is slow, but it is changing. But in the meantime, many people are still dying. The situation in developing countries is more often one of serious water pollution rather than shortage. Here countries have broken out of the vicious circle we mentioned by plunging into industrialization. But lack of planning, regulation and integration together with corruption mean that the development of proper infrastructure nearly always lags far behind. In 2007, for instance, one third of the Yellow River in China was so polluted its water was not fit for any human use at all. The waste and sewage discharged into the system that year totaled over 4 billion tonnes. 400 million people live along the Ganges in India, which is one of the five most polluted rivers in the world. Human sewage, industrial waste, religious offerings, even partly cremated human bodies are released into the river. But many poorer people rely on the same river on a daily basis for bathing, washing clothes and cooking. Many rivers and lakes are polluted by fertilizers which run off farming land and kill fish stocks, wildlife and cause toxic algal blooms. In May 2007 this happened to Lake Tai in eastern China, used for fresh water by 30 million people. The water was condemned as unfit for personal, agricultural and industrial use. Furthermore, many water sources like the Mekong River cross several borders. Serious depletion and pollution may lead to hostility between nations. In these circumstances, it is essential water is shared on a needs basis rather than a rights basis. As increasing economic wealth comes, these problems will be sorted out, but it needs much greater overall planning and integration and much less bureaucracy and corruption. But unfortunately, as the history of modern industrialization tends to show, that is the human way.